Thank you to Vishal. Thank you to PK. Thank you, Karthik, for putting this session together. And when we talked about 7.30 in the morning on a Thursday, how do we really engage all of your attention with the most interesting topic? We decided non-invasive techniques and PAD and venous disease was really the topic that's going to get you out of your seats in the morning. All this being said, I say that facetiously, but all of you guys, when you go out into your practice, your practice will live and die by your non-invasive lab. It will. It's the thing that's going to be able to give you your patients and your diagnoses. And it's going to be the thing that's going to be, allow you to follow up on your patients in a non-invasive way. You can have office hours everywhere you want, but unless you have these kind of testing that gives you the idea of who needs an intervention and who does not, really you're kind of wasting your time. You really do need a good uh, non-invasive lab wherever you go. All of you guys, if you guys are planning on having an endovascular lab, I encourage you guys to look into getting your RPVI. The scope of that entire RPVI test is outside of the realm of this talk, but it gives you the ability to hold your own vascular lab where you can work with a good tech and do your own diagnostic study. So as we go through this, we're just going to kind of go over some of the things that we look for and some of this test that we can do. Obviously, 25 minutes for non-invasive testing for venous and arterial disease is kind of a lot. There are textbooks dedicated to this topic, but I'm going to do my best to go over some of the highlights that we have. Um, so we'll start off with the venous disease, and you will get, when you start off and you are the vascular person for your hospital or the vascular person for your town, you will get a whole bunch of patients that come in with a variety of venous disease. Everything from swelling, I've never seen so many swelling patients before when I started. Basically, all my senior partners started sending them all to my office, and somehow I had an office that was full of lymphedema patients as soon as we started. But you'll get everyone that comes in from spider veins, the varicose veins, uh, the ulcers, healed ulcers, and some of the more chronic venous stasis changes that you see throughout. So the whole C through C0 through C6 level of disease you'll end up seeing in your office. In addition to this, you'll also see a lot of other kinds of leg swelling that are not vascular related. You know, when they start selling, sending these patients to you, you get patients who get lipedema, which is essentially abnormal distribution of fat throughout the leg that spares the feet. There's really no vascular intervention for that. And if you end up going and doing a GSV ablation for someone like this, they'll be like, what the hell did you do to me? None of this is helping and my fat is still there. So, and then lymphedema and some of the other things that come to your office, it's important for you as the vascular specialist to identify which kind of swelling and which kind of disease process is something that's worthwhile treating from an endovascular standpoint. Venous duplex is the gold standard for what we do, and it really gives you a lot of information. Uh, it, you're really doing this when you're considering, uh, this has to come after the whole interview with the patient. What are they coming for? What are the physical exam? What are the actual signs and symptoms that, you're, that they're describing to you? And if it does fit like the whole venous picture, you know, if, if it's not like all my, all my family has big legs and all their feet are spared, but my legs seem to be fat. I mean, that's not really the patient that you're going to be getting these studies on, but patients who are coming to you with a non-healing venous stasis ulcer on the medial malleolus, that's something where the story kind of fits. Then you want to go in and get the venous ultrasound to give yourself your diagnosis. And you're looking at two separate veins for your venous ultrasounds. You're looking at your deep veins and your superficial veins. And, tip and typically, whenever you're getting these studies, specifically, you're looking for DVTs, uh, SVTs, and reflux. Okay, and that's what you're looking for. Um, when you do your deep venous uh, study, you're checking for reversal of flow in your duplex where you have the flow going away from your probe, and then with Valsalva, the flow reverses. And typically, in the iliac and femoral veins, meaningful reflux is greater than two seconds of time in that time period. Uh, it's important that you work with your tech so that they're actually doing the Valsalva maneuvers uh, properly. When you're doing your uh, re reflux study for the lower extremities, the patient should be on a standing position. In patients who can't, you can do reverse Trendelenburg or something like this. But for the most part, you need to be able to give some sort of Valsalva or some sort of reverse pressures to elicit and uncover that reflux. In the popliteal vein, the same amount of reflux that's thought to be significant is greater than one second. For the superficial venous uh, incompetence, hopefully this video will play. It does not. Uh, there's two things that you want to look for. Uh, the meaningful reflux time is greater than 0 0.5 seconds. Like this person is crazy, right? So this is in immediately after your study when you're standing them up and you push their calves so that you can get the blood beyond the actual lesion. You're getting reflux of around 10 seconds in this patient. That's someone with significant reflux. But diagnostic criteria is greater than 0 0.5 seconds is going to give you 
um, meaningful superficial venous reflux. The normal size of the great saphenous vein is two or less, so uh, two millimeters or less. So anything that's greater than 0 0.5 centimeters at the super, uh, at saphenofemoral junction is thought to be significant and someone who's going to meet criteria. Why are these criteria important? When you see your patient and you submit them for a GSV ablation from your office, uh, your insurance companies, these are the things that are going to be important for you to elicit in your note and your study for you to be approved. Uh, the anatomy that you want to look for, obviously the great saphenous vein is the one that's talked about the most often. It's the one that's going to run along the medial surface of the leg all the way throughout. But up at the junction, you also have the anterior accessory of the great saphenous vein. You also have a posterior accessory of the great saphenous vein. And really, you want to look at the reflux at the level of the junction, where the saphen that saphenous vein is plugging into the... Uh, femoral vein, that's where you want to look for the reflux. In the back, you have the small saphenous vein that comes up from the bottom uh, and plugs into the popliteal vein, and oftentimes you want to see whether or not there's reflux at that junction as well. Uh, knowing this distribution of veins is important because when patients come to you, they'll have ulcers or they'll have big varicosities along these distributions. So patient with a big anterior, um, you know, anterior thigh varicose veins that you see on their physical exam, but you see like small saphenous vein reflux, I mean, yeah, you can by all means go ahead and treat that small saphenous vein reflux, but is it gonna give you meaningful resolution of the varicose veins that you have in the anterior thigh? Most likely not. So you have to know that the varicose veins that you're getting are related in, in the anatomical distribution that these veins are supposed to go. Perforators are important. I've gone to look for them a lot more often than we used to in the past. So the per perforators are junctions between the superficial veins uh, that run along your surface, as well as the deep veins that are deeper down in the leg. A meaningful reflux, you, you, there's no real criteria. There's no valve closure time that you can measure on reflux, but you do see reverse the color flow on your color Doppler. And really, you're looking at the size of the crossing at the fascia, and the diagnostic criteria that's meaningful is greater than 0 0.4 centimeters. The reason why this is important is you can treat all the great saphenous veins and the small saphenous veins that you want, but when sometimes when you have these patients with chronic venous stasis ulcers that you just cannot get to close despite Unibu therapy, despite GSV ablation, oftentimes they will have a gigantic you know, perforator in that area. And until you close that perforator, that whole venous area is very, very hypertrophied um, and hyperperfused. So it's difficult to actually close it down. And it's been one of the more remarkable things I've seen. You close down a perforator around the area of a wound and that wound will close a lot faster. So it's something to look for specifically when you guys have wounds or something like this in a certain area, your tech needs to know to look for the perforators in that region. It's not part of the, it's not part of regular protocols for venous vascular ultrasound. You know, you, you see the protocols that they have, you go down the cath and look at the GSV, but specifically you have to look for perforators in the case of a wound. Um, it's very good for, okay, so you've gone on, you've identified your venous reflux. It's also very good for looking at um, your follow-up to your therapy. So you've done your venous ablation. You hear about endovenous thermal, uh, endothermal heat-induced thrombosis. So that's EHIT. So oftentimes after you do a laser vein, uh, laser ablation or radio frequency ablation of the great saphenous vein, the whole, por the whole idea is to thrombose your saphenous vein but not have any of the thrombus go into the actual common femoral vein. So when you do your follow-up on these patients, typically most people will do it within one week of your GSV ablation. You're gonna to check to see, do you have thrombus that's at the saphenofemoral junction or extending into the common femoral vein? So that's one of the feared uh, complications that you can get, right? Like you're trying to take care of someone's uh, varicose veins and you give them a whopping DVT, that's terrible. And the whopping DVT leads to a PV. That's even worse. So the whole idea is you need to do a regular follow-up to make sure that you're not going to cause any harm and that your therapy looks good. Um, and the typical EHIT definitions, EHIT uh, one is when the clock comes all the way up to the saphenofemoral junction. EHIT two is when you have extension of the uh, thrombus into the actual lumen, less than 50% of the common femoral vein. E hit three is when you have greater than 50% of the common femoral vein with thrombus, and E hit four is when you have complete occlusion of the common femoral vein. Okay, so there's updated criteria by the uh, American Venus Forum, so I encourage you to go ahead and look at that. And typically, you should do this within one week, but this is a good result that you can see where you have ablation of the GSV, still uh, flow through the anterior accessory saphenous vein, and good flow into the uh, common femoral vein. 
A lot of the patients, about 26, it's been estimated that about 26% of the patients will have a leg ulcer with both PAD and venous disease. So it's important for you to do a good physical exam on patients. I know this is tried and true, but always look for pulses. In addition, even when patients do have some ulcers like this, it's important to know that up to 26% have mixed venous disease. So you need to know that they have arterial disease as well. Um, PAD may limit the ability to adequately treat venous disease with compression. I get to ask this question all the time. My circulation is bad. Can I put on compression stockings? The answer is how bad is your PAD truly? So typically you put on patients, you give them compression stockings are about 25 to 30 millimeters of mercury, right? So your blood pressure, systolic blood pressure should be a lot higher than that. So when you're doing your non-invasive testing, you can use compression up to 40 millimeters of mercury if ABI in these patients are greater than 0 0.5 or the absolute ankle pressure is greater than 16 millimeters of mercury. Makes sense, right? As long as your systemic pressure in that area can overcome the external compression, you should be okay. This is a constant question that gets asked by people over and over again. A venous stasis ulcer will never heal unless you have good compression on it. So you, despite, even if they have some underlying PAD, you can't just leave them alone because the legs will continue to swell and the legs will continue to fall apart. Um, PAD is a whole spectrum of disease. And I, I like putting up this slide. This is from the Journal of American College of Cardiology. When you look at patients who come for all kinds of studies, more than 50% of patients have atypical leg pain, meaning we talk about arteries and veins, and that's why we're here in this course. When patients come to your office, a whole bunch of them will have a variety of different reasons why their legs hurt. Their knee hurts. Their back hurts. They have shooting pain going there down, down their buttocks that's consistent with sciatica. Your arterial or your venous intervention is not going to help with these patients. So when you're getting these studies, even though you find something on your actual study, it's important for you to recognize what the actual symptomatology is, whether or not your treatment is actually going to fix it. So have a good idea of what your history is and whether or not correlates to your study results. Um, for PED, switching to the arterial side, we're ta really talking about two different things. In your office, you can answer two studies. Number one, is there an arterial flow problem? And this is your physiologic testing. This is your ABI, your PBRs, your segmental limb pressures and continuous wave Dopplers that can be performed both at rest and with exercise. And then uh, imaging study, which is, uh, you know, asking where is the actual anatomic lesion? You know, you, where you physically want to diagnose where it is. And we're going to talk about duplex ultrasonography. You have some other speakers who are coming up. We're going to talk about CT and MRN geography. And throughout this entire day, you'll hear about different catheter-based angiography topics. We have some really good speakers coming up. So looking forward to that throughout the day. Um, the quick and dirty way to do things when you see a patient in the emergency room, I guess if you're in the office and you don't have any equipment, is to do an ABI. An ABI is ankle brachial index. Mm -hmm. You take the highest ankle um, systolic blood pressure of each leg and compare it uh, over the highest brachial systolic blood pressure on both arms. So you've got to take blood pressures on both arms and both legs and you're taking the highest number and just mm -hmm. dividing it. It's okay. It's the cornerstone of PAD diagnosis, but it's not great for many reasons, as you know. And uh, we'll talk about that in, in one setting. So let's look at this one, for example. So you take a blood pressure in the right arm. It's 160. Left arm, 120. You're going to use the 160. That's the higher number. And then you do it in the legs. You have a blood pressure of 40 over 80 and a, and a pressure of 80 over 120. You're going to take the highest number, 120 which is going to give you on the left side 0 0.75. On the right side, you're taking the 80. That gives you 0.5. Very easy way to do it. Um, not the most sophisticated, a lot of limitations. It does not give you any localization of the level of disease. Even the same person that you end up doing like five seconds later, there's some variability. I mean, like, it's the same thing, right? You sit in the office, you run your blood pressure cuff like six times, you're going to get a whole variety of diseases. And we're, this is a study that's based off of that. So you can imagine that there's going to be some variability there. Um, it cannot really be used in the setting of calcifications because the whole premise behind blood pressure cuff is that it needs to obliterate the flow beyond the area. And then as you release, you're getting some flow and that's what you're recognizing. But if the patient has significant diabetes or significant uh, end-stage renal disease or very bad smoking history and they've got rocks of calcium around that vessel, you're going to get falsely elevated numbers. Uh, ABI is up to 1.4. does not mean they have super circulation down by the legs. It means they have really crappy vessels. Okay. Um, in those kind of patients, a toe brachial index is a lot better. The toe, the smaller micro vessels are less prone to kind of that kind of um, abnormal elevation in your ABI. All right. 
Uh, so when you take this to the next level, and then you're talking about physiologic testing with mm -hmm. segmental pressures, it's the same idea, except you have cuffs along four different areas. Uh, and at Mount Sinai, we have five blood pressure cuffs that we use, one at the mid-thigh, one at the calf, one at the ankle, one at the metatarsal, and one at the toe. And this gives you a lot of information. So you're getting a pulse wave Doppler where you can actually see the flow. You're getting segmental pressures at the area. And one of the things that this gives you the ability to do is kind of identify and start to pinpoint where the level of disease is. So a meaningful drop in the level of disease is 20 millimeters of mercury. So in a patient like this, you see 143 at the thigh, 114 at the calf, then roughly you get a, a sense that this is around the area that you're going to have your disease. Um, when you're looking at the pulse volume flows, it's not, this is always difficult to interpret. People are like, oh my God, the peaks are super high here, so that must be good. It's actually the shape of the wave that ends up being more important. This is a normal waveform where you have a sharp upstroke, a dichrotic notch. Um, and as the disease progresses, you start to lose initially the dichrotic notch, you get flattened peak, and then you get severely abnormal flat waveform. So it's obviously more qualitative. And when you're taking a look at this, you're trying to say which areas look like they have more disease than the other. It's important to walk them. Uh, oftentimes, you'll get something like this. You talk to a patient. They give you the typical history of claudication. I get pain when I walk about two, two blocks. But uh, you do your initial study, and you see like kind of normal, normal study results. I think it's very important to have a physiologic ability to walk them on the treadmill. This is the same patient. We walk them on the treadmill about 12% grade at 2 miles per hour for around 7 minutes. And then the patient starts to complain about their pain. And when they get their pain again, you retest them. And you'll see significant drops in their ABI as you start to unmask their actual level of disease. Okay, so I think it's this, you know, just the resting ABI alone is not enough for patients who are complaining about claudication. Uh, toe brachial indices, normal is 0.7. Use it when the ABIs are falsely elevated. I'll just briefly touch on TCPO2 because you'll hear about it once in a while. It's not really very well validated at the moment. Some people will use it as a marker to see whether or not their wound is going to heal. Um, the TCPO2 less than 40 is the number for some of you guys who take your exams, where under your 40 uh, value, the thought is that your wound won't heal. Now, all this being said, there's a lot of different variability in TCPO2 in the clinical setting. Patients with CHF, any kind, any kind of edema, pulmonary disease, you'll get falsely uh, elevated or diminished values. So just be on the lookout for TCPO2. Um, I, we are running a little bit lower on time, so we'll just touch on ultra, uh, duplex ultrasonography as our final thing, and then we'll kind of finish here. Um, oftentimes in our lab, we'll get both the ABI PVR with the P along with a duplex ultrasound at the same time that gets initiated if there is any kind of abnormality. So if we see any kind of drop values, then immediately the patient will get a arterial duplex at the same time. And the arterial duplex gives you the ability to figure out where is the actual level of lesion. It's low cost. You need a good sonographer who can look at the different areas and give you the ability to give you a diagnosis. Um, and this is kind of the thing that you're looking for. You're looking for areas where you have turbulent flow across the area of a lesion. And when you end up getting the peak systolic velocity across the area, you'll end up getting you know, elevated velocities across any tight narrowing that you have. And the numbers to remember is just one number, greater than 200. So greater than 200 uh, centimeters per second is thought to be a hemodynamically significant lesion of greater than 50%. Okay, so. There's a lot of different other numbers. You're not going to intervene for any number less than 200. And even that 200 number, you want to think about what kind of setting is this happening in? I guess this patient undergone a previous intervention. Is there a stent or something like this in this place? Um, and then it's really important for follow-up uh, to do both your base. Uh, the reason why we talk about all this testing and why it's important is that you should get a baseline before you do any kind of intervention. Dr. Sharma came up here this morning, talked to you about these amazing techniques that you can try to cross these lesions, but you have to know whether or not you actually help this patient, right? You can, it might look good angiographically, but physiologically and with your non-invasive testing, have you improved the patient? Have a baseline ABI and PVR, and then when they follow up, get an ABI PVR in addition to your uh, duplex ultrasound to look at your lesion. And typically, most people will do uh, one month... It, 
we'll do the exam, and as long as there's no symptoms, mm -hmm. typically I do a three-month follow-up, six-month follow-up, and actually I've gone away from this, and I do one-year follow-up as long as the three-month and six-month follow-ups are okay. And what you're looking for is <laughs> elevated velocities in a particular area. I'll end with just one last thing is that currently uh, there is no real published guideline that tells you how to follow up on a stented vessel. It's not necessarily been duplicated. Most people will use a uh, velocity of greater than 300 centimeters per second, 300 as the number within a stent that it's meaningful ISR. But oftentimes when you get an ultrasound immediately after for a stent to the area, you might see some elevated velocities there, but 300 is a number. And you should routinely do your follow-up to decide whether or not you're gonna re-intervene on the patient. I think I'm just gonna end there. Thank you very much. I think I don't want to be the first one to hold up and be last. I'd be like late, so that's good. All right, thank you very much.